Today's Law and Society Fellow Talk. My name is Sandy Arani, and I am the Associate Director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Institute, uh, we are the world's leading venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science. The Institute was founded in 2012 with a generous grant from the Simons Foundation. And we bring together the world's leading researchers in theoretical computer science in, and related fields, as well as fostering the next generation of young scholars. Um, before we get started, just want to go over some logistics. So today's event is hybrid. So if you're sitting in the auditorium here, um, you can feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. And if you're attending over Zoom, you can type your question to the Q&A and I will see it and can ask Jessica the question on your behalf. Um, so the um, Simons Institute Law and Society Fellowship Program is a recent addition to the Institute. It was started in 2020. Um, and having the Law and Society Fellows here enhances our programs, in particular the ones that address technologies with profound Im impacts on human society and that have implications for ethics, law, and policy. And um, this semester, we've been really lucky to have um, Jessica Hallman with us today, uh, all semester long as our Law and Society Fellow. Um, Jessica is the Ginny Romady Associate Professor of Computer Science at Northwestern University. And her research addresses challenges that arise when people draw inductive inferences from data summaries. Um, she's won numerous awards for her work, including best paper awards at top vis visualization and HCI venues. Um, she's a recipient of the Microsoft Faculty Award and an NSF Career Award, among other things. Um, her talk title today is Using Theories of Decision-Making Under Uncertainty to Improve Data Visualiz Visualization. So please join me in welcoming Jessica. Thanks. All for coming. Um, so yeah, I am the Law and Society Fellow here. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is a lot of what I think about as a researcher. So, um, you know, I work in data visualization and interfaces and, you know, I care a lot about the role of summaries of data for helping people draw generalizations from, you know, samples. Um, and so, you know, when we consider the role of data and judgment and decision making, we sort of have to care about things like visualizations because they influence you know, what we get from data sets or predictions that we get from models um, in settings from, you know, civic behavior where we might look at election forecast plots like this and try to make decisions about, you know, how much effort or money should we invest in trying to get our candidate elected um, to, you know, the scientific literature where visualizations are important for, you know, showing things like experiment results for, um, you know, helping us understand what's going on in terms of like deep uh, neural nets. Um, and all of this is, you know, helping us drive new research by trying to understand the data that we collect. And so my core research program um, is not so much about law, but about how to design and evaluate, uh, you know, data summaries. And in particular, I care a lot about how we communicate uncertainty, which is, I think, where my work does connect more with societal implications. So, um, you know, people, you know, in general, in, in everyday life, we're always being confronted with data as well as in science. And so how do we help people do things like make good effect size judgments or separate signal from noise? Um, how do we make sure that they update their beliefs in sort of a rational way, given new information on some, you know, parameter that people might care about, like some rate of disease? Um, how do we help them do things like causal inference to understand what affects, you know, um, you know, things again, like disease rates? And so, um, you know, I ask a bunch of questions related to tasks like this. I think about different populations to some extent, so both lay audiences as well as experts. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so what I want to talk about today is this question that's really sort of core to the kind of research I do, which is, um, you know, how do we design effective visualizations for inductive inference? So again, for people, you know, looking at data and trying to generalize or extrapolate to some larger population or phenomena. And so I want to start by giving you a little background on how this question is often approached in research on data visualization or data interfaces. So, um, cause I think it might surprise you a little. So, um, one very common approach, for instance, in visualization research is to try to find designs that maximize perceptual accuracy. Um, and the idea is that, you know, we're showing people data, we want them to read the data values accurately. And so we can do things like graphical perception experiments, um, you know, which started back in psychophysics in the 60s, where people um, would do things like show people, um, in this case, like a chart, 
where we have two marked sections and ask them to do low level sort of visual um, tasks like tell me you know what proportion the smaller marked bar is of the larger um, and so the idea is that by having lots of people do tasks where we vary the way that we're encoding the data we can rank different um, encodings and say for instance that you know if you're showing quantitative data you should not use like an area encoding so don't encode your, your numerical data as circular area because people are really bad at judging that instead use something like position in a scatter plot or actually position in a bar chart with a common axis because you're just really looking at the position of the tops of the bars and so and so this works for for you know telling us how well people read data but you know optimizing for accuracy and perception has some limits if we look at you know people trying to draw inferences and make predictions from visualizations. Um, so, you know, one problem we see is that, you know, in, an, in a context like an election, we could show someone um, this election uh, prediction. Um, and, you know, with a display like this, there's very little perceptual error if we care about someone getting the probability that each candidate wins. Um, they can just read it right there. Um, but just because they got the probability with no error does not mean that they're actually going to use it rationally or to make utility optimal decisions. So. For instance, you know, many people I think see something like this, they don't know what to do with a probability like 71.4%. And so they might use some sort of rule of thumb, like if this seems far enough from 50%, I'm just gonna, you know, um, I'm just gonna round it up. Um, on the other hand, you know, we could show them something that makes the perception of the probability a lot harder. There's gonna be a lot more error, like this animated gauge that uh, the New York Times used on election night of 2016. Um, so perceptual error will be higher, but they might actually integrate the uncertainty into their decisions in a case like this because it's hard to ignore. Um, we also sometimes see people using things like user satisfaction or user centered design. So you might ask people, which of these two displays do you find more effective? Chances are, if you ask people these kinds of questions about representations of uncertainty, they will tell you they prefer something like on the left because it feels really easy to use it. You can just sort of ignore um, the uncertainty, whereas this really is hard if you want to ignore uncertainty and you can't. So accuracy and perception doesn't always work. Another kind of more broadly framed objective that we often see is to build visualization tools and design visualizations to sort of maximize someone's chances of finding patterns in the data. And so, you know, for example, judging from their features, a lot of these kind of like state of the art um, systems like Tableau software that, that are kind of very dominant in market share in sort of the data analytics space are really sort of optimized to make it as easy as possible to sort of pick out the patterns. So, um, you know, I can drag and drop variables to shelves. It's going to recommend visualizations to me. I don't have to think about even what I really want to show um, or how I want to plot the different variables. It's going to aggregate the data by default so that it's really easy to see trends and differences. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, we sort of we sort of care about you know just putting the patterns in front of people. But this obviously breaks down again um, for inference. Uh, so consider, for instance, you know, someone trying to explore data and generalize to a population. So they have samples and they're using some visual analysis tool and they want to say things about the population from which the samples are drawn. Um, we did an experiment a few years ago where we showed people um, uh, statistical graphics that either used aggregation or did not. Um, they saw samples and they were asked to tell us, you know, what would you um, conclude about the population from these from these different displays and everyone was assigned to either aggregated data or disaggregated data or disaggregated data with a mean um, and what we found um, as maybe you would predict is that uh, when people see aggregated data the way that they talk about sort of effect size is different um, so when we looked at the kind of things they wrote down a lot of times it was sort of um, as though they were thinking about effects in this kind of signal detection framework where an effect or a difference or a trend is either present or absent. Um, on contrast, in the disaggregated display conditions, um, people tended to talk about things like the size of an effect, the reliability of an effect, and so people were sort of weighing the uncertainty or the, the noise relative to the signal. We also saw that when you show people aggregated data, um, at least people who aren't trained um, statisticians, they tend to be insensitive to sample size. So we could show them, you know, a visualization of 20 points versus 2000 points, and they're going to be equally confident in what they conclude about the population. And so disaggregated data um, by default sort of shows you the sample size. Um, and so to make sure that the visualizations and the visualization tools that we're developing, you know, support inference from data, I think, you know, what I've sort of concluded is that we need more robust objectives than kind of these standard things that we use in our field. Um, and, you know, I use the term robust here in the sense of like robust, uh, the way you would talk about a predictive model where we want interfaces that perform well, 
or as expected, despite changes in the inputs or the conditions, including errors or misuse of the visualizations, whatever that might be. And so, you know, I've spent a lot of time developing visualization techniques for things like visualizing uncertainty, as well as interaction paradigms, things like, you know, how do we get people to think about what their prior is for some parameter before we show them data. Um, but what's driven a lot of my work is this question of like, what is the right objective to design for um, when we approach a visualization problem and some of uh, my work that I'll talk about today has really driven me towards theory, which sort of explains why I wanted to come to Simon's Institute, because I think um, to sort of really understand some of uh, and answer some of these questions, we have to get a little bit more formal. Um, so I want to first talk about, you know, trying to take seriously an objective related to, you know, saying that a good visualization supports good reasoning under uncertainty. Um, and of course, we have to make that a little more specific. And so, um, you know, one type of judgment that we might think about when we're showing people visualizations of distribution, whether it's for forecasting or in the scientific literature, um, is that people should be able to judge effect size. And effect size here um, refers to basically, you know, our ability to judge kind of the distance between distributions, but also account for the, um, or sorry, the, the location of distributions, but also account for the scale. Um, so we want to sort of think about like how big is the signal to noise ratio and one way that we can you know ask people to report their perceptions of effect size in a visualization is called probability of superiority and so um, this has been said to be sort of a more intuitive way to ask people to think about effect size we can ask them like what's the probability if I take a random sample from the distribution B here, it would be greater than a random sample from A. Um, and so this is kind of a nice way to think about effect size because I think you know often we show people sort of uh, fixed effects, um, you know, estimates of fixed effects, and it's hard for them to always think about like, what does that effect mean at the level of the underlying measurements? And so um, here we're, we can imagine, you know, we're sort of asking someone like, if you ran some within subjects experiment and people, you know, did some task with and without some treatment, like if you drew a random person, what's the chances that they benefited from the treatment? Um, and so one thing we might realize though, is that if this is sort of an important judgment to do from visualizations, um, sort of standard statistical graphics we see used to express distribution make it pretty hard. Um, so here, you know, if I wanna answer this question, like for one, I couldn't tell if these are in, uh, independent or correlated uh, random variables from a static display like this, it's just impossible to know. But even if they're independent, like to answer this question, I sort of have to do, kind of like compute an integral. Um, so do basically do like area judgments. People are really bad at this. I have to then do some um, calculations on my integrals um, and any kind of mental calculation usually leads to error. And so, you know, it's just a hard judgment to do and it's not gonna be any better with, with you know, other types of common representations of uncertainty. Um, and so, you know, this is a very simple example. We just have two distributions. And so we could just plot the difference um, and then people could see this. and. Um, you know, they get more direct information, but the idea of visualization that makes it sort of challenging is that often, you know, we don't want to assume that we know exactly what people want from a visualization. So often we have multivariate data and we want to design visualizations without having to know exactly what comparisons someone wants to make. And so these are just, you know, two random variables. You can imagine my data is more complex. Um, how do I support these kind of judgments? Um, and so one thing I did a long time ago as a PhD student actually is, is try to figure out like how would we design a visualization display for this type of judgment. So if we care about effect size as probability of superiority. And so what we came up with was basically like imagine you have your observed data, say A and B are you know, a treatment and, and a control in some experiment. We're going to generate other sort of alternative reasonable versions of that data set we might see if we repeated data collection. So here we can fit a model to A and B and sample from that, um, or we could just do sort of non-parametric um, kind of resampling with replacement. But we wanna make sort of different versions of the data that we could see under the same uh, generating process. And then we'll visualize each of them um, as, as a plot. Um, and the important thing here is that we keep things like the y-axis scaling consistent because we wanna, um, we don't want things, uh, the, the scales changing because then we can't compare these things. But after we do that, we can sort of put them together in an animation and people can kind of watch the uncertainty play out um, and they can get probability of superiority now easily because you know they can just watch how often these, these two bars change order. Um, and so this is you know okay maybe for these 2D charts, maybe you wonder like, is this really worth it? But if you consider all of the different types of visualizations where the visualization is more complex, the data structure is more complex, um, these are the cases that are hard to visualize uncertainty for because we basically have to add new visual encodings 
Um, and that often breaks kind of things that we like about the chart. So one nice thing about these hypothetical outcome plots is that as long as I can generate sort of reasonable data from the same process, um, and as long as I'm not using animation already, I can show uncertainty for all sorts of things like, you know, forecasts where we have state correlations, icon arrays, if I want to keep with like this frequency framing, I don't want to add like shading or blur, um, and even things like, you know, uh, communities, predicted communities and social network graphs, um, where we have to think a little bit harder about how to keep the scales, things like the color scale or the color assignment um, and the node positions consistent, but basically we now have a way to show uncertainty. So. So that's nice, um, but in doing all this work on trying to sort of think about how do we design better visualizations for effect size judgment, one of the things I started to become curious about based on sort of experiments I was doing is how do people make these judgments when they don't have a visualization that really supports it? Um, so like we talked about, you know, things like standard density plots make it sort of hard to do these judgments. Um, and so we did some experiments that sort of gave us some clues about how people, um, and I'm talking about people who are not really trained in stats here, are, are estimating things like probability superiority. Um, so in one of these experiments, we told people they were gonna be in this fictional um, boulder sliding competition. So it was like a winter games thing and they were sliding a boulder on ice um, and they were trying to get a higher score so that they could beat their competitor. And they had this choice of whether they would use the standard boulder or a special boulder, which would help them slide their boulder farther. Um, and what we wanted to look at here is, you know, what's the difference in how people perceive the effect size and how much they're, say, willing to pay for this, this special boulder if we show them inferential uncertainty, so the, the uncertainty in the estimated average sliding distance versus um, kind of measurement or predictive uncertainty, so the uncertainty in the underlying, um, you know, distribution of measurements. Um, and so we gave people either a 95% CI or a 95% predictive interval chart, and we gave them the corresponding intervals, which are, um, you know, predictably, uh, you know, related if you have a Gaussian distribution in text. So these were sort of informationally equivalent, except the conditions varied based on which we visualize, predictive or, or inferential. And, you know, maybe someone has a guess where, what do you think, do you think the, the probability superiority judgments were the same? Do you predict? No, maybe. <laughs> I would predict, but sorry, I don't know if I understand. So what is showing us the uncertainty in the estimated mean on these like your sliding distances for these boulders, and one is showing us uh, kind of the the variance in the underlying distribution. So it's. 1.96, the mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation or the mean plus or minus 1.96, the standard error. So it's basically a confidence interval versus what you would call coverage or a predictive interval. So what we saw, which maybe uh, is not surprising if you think about visualization, but is maybe more surprising uh, here is that people we're much more likely to overestimate the effect size with the inferential uncertainty. So, um, you know, we had them tell us the probability of superiority. We, we asked them how much they'd be willing to pay for the special boulder. And we actually also elicited how they perceived the underlying measurement distributions. And all of these um, were much more likely to overestimate um, sort of predictability um, and effect size uh, on the left. Um, and so one thing this made us wonder is like, well, what are people doing that makes this chart lead to such different responses? Um, and so one thing that we tried was like, well, maybe maybe people see how how visually distant how visually distant the two distributions look on the far left, and maybe they're somehow mapping that to effect size. And so we we did another condition where we showed them the ninety five percent confidence intervals, but we we changed the axis scaling so that they were seen. Um, the, the score range implied by the actual measurements. Um, and so we found that this attenuated the bias, like it, it went down in terms of uh, effect size judgments and willingness to pay. Interestingly, all of, no matter what condition um, they saw, people were overestimating effect size in all of these. So we could help them a little with this. Um, they didn't do quite as well as they did with this still, but um, it had some effect, but there's still, people are still overestimating. This. And so, I mean, these results are consistent with people paying attention to things like visual distances and perhaps between the means of each distribution, and then using that as a proxy for effect size. And so, um, so if this is what people do when we show them, you know, visualizations of distribution, um, that's kind of interesting to know about because, you know, maybe we want to uh, try harder to design against this. Um, this previous study I just showed, we hadn't actually set out to, um, to see what strategies people were using. And so we did a follow-up study where we wanted to look more directly at like 
the extent to which people are, are looking at things like visual distances when they see uncertainty or distribution. Um, so we set up a task in this experiment where we show people some true effect sizes in terms of probability superiority. So that's the X axis here. And then we asked for their responses. Um, what did they perceive the probability of superiority as? Um, and then we can compare sort of curves that we fit to their data. So each person's gonna do multiple trials and see multiple ground truth effect sizes. And we can fit sort of functions that describe the amount of bias in their perception of probability of superiority. So, you know, if you're just reporting the ground truth, it's gonna be a diagonal line. Um, if you're uh, relying on some sort of heuristic that looks at things like distances, you're gonna see something closer to an S shaped, um, an S shape. So you're basically, um, you're over, overestimating, you know, probabilities on the small end of the scale and underestimating at the higher end. Um, and the way we set up the task was that uh, specifically, um, we varied the standard deviation in the visualizations or the distributions we showed them in order to um, produce situations where the, if you're using some sort of mean distance, like you're looking at the distance between the means of each visualization uh, or each distribution, um, you would do better at high variance than at low variance. Um, because at high variance, it's gonna be a better cue for effect size. Um, so here's what this looked like. Um, basically, like I said, we had two different variance levels. So we're showing people distributions, um, two different variance levels in the distributions that they're shown, but we kept the, the axis range consistent. Um, and so in this case, we're again, sort of telling them to think about this kind of sports um, scenario. So we're telling them, you know, you're playing a fantasy sports game. You have this choice of whether you wanna invest and pay to get a new player on your team, we can show you predictions of how your team will do in terms of score um, with the new player, which is red and without. Um, and your goal is to sort of, you know, uh, get a score above some threshold, because if you get that, you will win some award. Um, and so, like I said, you know, if you're relying on the distance between the means and sort of maybe normalizing that by the total Y or the total X distance here, um, you know, you're gonna do better at a, a higher variance. Um, and so in each trial, people are estimating effect size in terms of probability superiority. And then they're also making a decision, do I wanna buy, buy the new player? Um, and for this, we could define sort of the optimal decision rule, which was uh, to invest in the new player if the, the score difference was above some threshold. Um, so we were interested, like I said, in you know, to what extent people were relying on these strategies. And we thought maybe we could make people more likely to rely on these heuristics if we manipulated the charts in such a way that we made the means a little more salient to them. Um, and so in the top here, you know, we showed everybody saw, they were assigned to one of four different types of visualizations, but everyone saw some of those visualizations without any additional mark to show the mean and some with uh, a mark to show the mean. And the idea was that, you know, when you show people central tendency, they kind of over fixate on that. And in particular, like I said, um, these hypothetical outcome plots were kind of, you know, a visualization that we designed specifically for this type of judgment. And so we thought, you know, we could like cleverly show that like when you add a mean to these things, you drastically change how people use them um, because, you know, they'd start using this heuristic. Um, so that's not, however, what we found. Um, the results of this study, um, which ended up winning a best paper, uh, were kind of surprising to us. So one of the things we found was that across the board, everywhere, people appeared to be relying on distance heuristics. Um, it didn't matter if we annotated the means. And in fact, even for the hypothetical outcome plots, which we expected to be the most different, uh, if you annotate the means, um, there was very little difference. And what, luckily we had asked people to describe um, what strategies they were using to make these judgments. And what, what we found was that, for instance, for the hypothetical outcome plots, 85% roughly of people were doing exactly what we didn't want them to do. So the people who didn't see the means annotated, they were watching you know, the draw for each random variable. They were estimating the mean of each random variable. And then they were basically just like, you know, looking at the distance between the means. So that's like the exact opposite of sort of the optimal strategy. And so it, it, it was sort of interesting because you know, it took us several studies to, to realize that this kind of thing can happen. We also saw um, that a lot of the differences that we saw between visualizations, although, we were able to estimate them. We did, um, I've skipped over the details, but we specified Bayesian regression models um, that accounted for the full experiment structure. So we modeled all the interactions between these different manipulations. Um, and we got some differences that were reliable, but they were very small. It seemed like the visualization didn't really matter that much. Um, and so, you know, this, these results got me sort of thinking more about, you know, what are the challenges that we often run into when we're trying to study these types of problems where we're we're interested in showing people uncertainty, 
um, and we're trying to evaluate how to do that better. Um, and so, you know, for one, uh, there's this issue where the prevalence of these heuristics makes it hard to know when you've designed a better representation because often the optimal strategy, you know, for some tasks is going to produce a response that looks the same as the heuristic. And so it can be hard to sort of distinguish when do we have one versus the other case. Um, and so, you know, uh, this is sort of interesting because like if the optimal strategy and the heuristic perform similarly, it would kind of imply that the visualization doesn't really matter that much. Um, and I think often the visualization does matter. It's just that like if we're using probability superiority as the objective, it's not quite capturing that. Um, and so one sort of uh, line of follow up work um, based on all this um, is that, you know, it's gotten me thinking about like what is an objective to design these representations of uncertainty for that is less agnostic to the strategy someone is using. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail about it today or present any results, but one idea is that, whoops, there's this nice connection um, between the idea of doing a posterior predictive check in a Bayesian statistical workflow and a good visualization. So a good visualization is one that helps you compare your expectations about data to the observed data. Um, and so in some work, I'm trying to sort of formalize, formalize this idea of like comparing predictions against observed data as kind of a thing that we can design for. Um, like I said, I won't talk about that. I've written a paper about that if you're interested. Um, other issues that this kind of study got me thinking about. So another is that, you know, as in most behavioral experiments, we have kind of noisy responses from people. So people, you know, respond within and across them. There's a lot of variance if you ask them the same question. Um, but on top of that, in visualization experiments, you know, we're dealing with some inherent stochastic stochasticity um, because we're generating samples often from some data generating process. And so there's some inherent randomness there. And if we're not directly modeling this, it can be hard to know, like, when are we likely um, to see an effect? And when is, when is any given effect likely to be sort of swamped by this, this um, randomness? Another problem that sort of keeps me up at night related to experiments like this is that I think they're sort of inherently optimistic. Um, so whatever an experimenter is doing an experiment of the type that like the experimenter had some hunch about something that would help people um, and they go out to test it, it's almost like you're kind of morally obliged to study whatever your intervention is or whatever you think is going to help under conditions that are most likely to show you some, some difference. Because, you know, if you think something's going to help people, um, like I think people are going to do better on some task with some particular visualization, I'm not going to go out and find people that, you know, are already doing perfect on that task. Um, I'm not going to go out and find people that no matter what I show them, it doesn't matter. They always respond randomly. Like I'm going to look for the situations where it's likely to matter. And I think in visualization research, this manifests as sort of choosing um, or defining the range of stimuli that we test um, in sort of a narrow way. So it's like we're zooming in on the, the, the range in which we think we'll see an effect. Um, I think this happens in all sorts of experiments all the time, and it often gets overlooked. Um, and it's actually fine, I think, as long as when we interpret our results, we are very careful to say, like, this is conditional on this small range. I think what uh, the problem I see, including people interpreting my own research, is that often the interpretations are unconditional. So they say, you know, people see a, a study and they're like, oh, this visualization did better than this one, and therefore I should always use this visualization. And so that's problematic. Um, and in visualization, I think one nice thing is that we can actually model some of this, this <coughs> laziness. Um, we can try to you know, be more specific about how we might be zeroing in on things. Um, but all of this implies you know, we need better ways to reason about how much a better representation or a better visualization is likely to help in a given decision problem. So I'm talking here broadly about you know, problems related to some sort of judgment under uncertainty. And so these questions have pushed me to think more about theory. And so I wanna talk now about some work I've been doing um, in collaboration with some colleagues, uh, theorists. Um, so Yifan Wu and Michaelis uh, Mamakos are theory students at Northwestern. Jason Harline is my colleague. Um, but the idea is that we're going to try to formalize the value of visualization in a decision setting. And so um, there's two points you could say at which we might benefit from reasoning about the value of a better visualization. So one is before we run any specific experiment. So before we show people specific data samples and we gather behavioral data, we might want to reason about like, you know, how much value might a better visualization of uncertainty in this context um, add? Um, and so we can think about like, what are baselines we could compare to even before we've gathered data. Another time that we might want to do analysis um, is post experiment. So we've shown data, some or some shown some specific data samples to people. We've gathered their behavioral responses and maybe we now want to compare 
um, to sort of some theoretical kind of expectations um, to make sense of what we got in the behavioral data. Um, and the approach is going to be to use statistical decision theory to reason about visualization problems, um, both pre-experimentally and post-experimentally. Um, and so in order to do this, we have to define a decision task first. Um, and so I'm just going to do this for the KLA all paper, the one that I just presented um, on the, the mean distance heuristics. Um, and so here the state that's uncertain that people care about is whether um, you know, in the next game that's played, um, the team with the new player would win. Um, and so uh, that is uh, that score difference. So we have a score with the new player drawn from some normal distribution with a mean of variance and a score without um, the new player, similarly drawn from a, a normal distribution, the same variance across these two distributions. And um, theta is one if the score with the new player is greater than the score without. So that's the sort of um, information that the participant cares about. Um, we're asking them for the probability of superiority. The true probability of superiority can be defined um, here. It's, you know, we essentially get it from the difference in means divided by the pooled sample variance. Um, and we can think about the prior here, which I didn't talk about when I briefly went over this study, but basically we sampled eight uh, ground truth probability of superiority values between 0.55 and 0.95 to do this experiment. And so the prior would be like knowing that we took uh, you know, a draw from, these, from this discrete uniform distribution, like what would you report as your probability of superiority, which is the expectation over that. Um, and so um, we're gonna ask people to report you know, what they perceive as the probability of superiority. And, um, and then we need a scoring rule basically to, to tell us kind of, you know, um, the payoff that someone gets or the stakes of getting something wrong. Um, and so what's interesting is in our original experiment, we incentivized the decisions, the effect size decisions people had to make, but we did not even incentivize the probability of superiority judgments. And so, um, so it's interesting sort of, you know, to think about how much does this matter? Um, but here we're going to assume that we had used like a quadratic scoring rule um, just to analyze this problem. And I should state that like, if you look at a lot of uh, experiments on visualizations and interfaces, even the ones that involve, you know, reasoning under uncertainty, it's very hard to even pull out this basic information about like what decision problem is being studied. So um, it's, I think, very uncommon to even, you know, define things like a scoring rule or, or use a well-defined scoring rule in these experiments. So it's sort of interesting to think about that and what that means about the results that we get when we test um, interfaces if we haven't quite fully defined our problem. Um, so given these definitions or this decision problem, um, we can do some pre-experimental reasoning, as I mentioned, about the value of a better visualization in this particular task. Um, and so one kind of pre-experimental pre call we might want to make is roughly like when our study is, when is our study dead in the water? Um, and so this is kind of related to doing like a power analysis. If you do experimental research where you're trying to determine the sample size that you need in order to to detect an effect of a given size. Um, and so generally people do power analysis if they're using like a signal detection framework or a null hypothesis significance testing, but you don't have to only do, um, you can do pre-experimental analysis without using, you know, uh, significance testing. Um, the idea is that, you know, you might wanna know when your expected standard error um, from your experiment or your study design is larger than the effect that you're trying to detect. Um, and so Andrew Gelman, for instance, has written about how Certain psychology experiments, for instance, um, by uh, uh, Kurosawa here, um, are kind of dead in the water because the experimenter is setting out to test some effects. So in this case, um, Kurosawa does a lot of studies to look at how predictive different social factors um, that uh, things like characteristics of new parents are to affect the sex of the children that they have. And so these are experiments where you know, if you look at prior data, the expected effect in sort of probability of having a girl versus a boy in any subpopulation is going to be very small, like less than a one percentage point difference. Um, however, you know, you have psychologists running experiments on like a couple thousand people. And so you're sort of, you're, you're not going to be able to detect, uh, you know, a less than one percentage point um, difference because your standard error, if you, you know, uh, come up with an uncertainty interval is going to be like 10 percentage points. And so this is the kind of thing that we can do pre-experimentally. Um, but we want to do this for visualization studies. And so, um, you know, we could do a traditional power analysis, but it's kind of annoying to have to need a prior on the, the effect size. 
um, we'd rather not have to assume that. And so in this case, we're going to use the rational agent, which we can kind of draw on when we have visualizations or if we have a data problem. And we're going to um, use that in the definition of our decision problem to sort of do some yard sticking. Um, so we can roughly define dead in the water here as the case where the rational agent gains little information about the problem um, from the visualizations that they're shown. So let's start by setting up a scale for uh, different types of agents here. Um, so uh, in the case of the rational agent here, um, we might consider them with the visualization as kind of our upper bound. So, you, so they're gonna use the optimal decision rule. Um, they're gonna look at the visualization and gonna report their response. Um, we might wanna compare that um, for instance, or well, first let, let me pin it down to the KL paper. So for the KL paper, if we were talking about a rational agent with the visualization, we had recall these um, four different visualizations, but if you consider the rational agent who's gonna use the optimal decision rule, these are gonna be equivalent. Um, we're gonna assume that the rational agent can watch the animated hypothetical outcome plots indefinitely. And so, uh, so the upper bound is gonna be the same kind of for the rational agent with any of these visualizations. Um, we might then wanna ask, so what if the rational, or what if you had an agent who just had the prior basically, a rational agent who was given the prior, but no visualization, like where would that fall um, here? Uh, and the scale again is our scoring rule, which is quadratic, um, which you know uh, implies a scale from zero to one. And so we might want to know, you know, before we run the experiment, is the rational agent with prior going to be pretty close to the sort of maximum possible score you can get, or is it maybe is there more room for us to sort of see potentially differences um, from a better visualization? And so we can do this um, for the KLAL study. So the rational agent with the visualization here gets a score of 0.832. Um, if we think about the prior, we had these eight ground truth effect sizes. Um, you were uniformly likely to get any of them. Um, the prior implied by that actually puts the score very close to the rational agent with the visualization. So there's, we've already sort of learned that this study is on some level, at least with a quadratic scoring rule, kind of dead in the water. There's not a lot of room um, to see differences in here. Um, and so, you know, at this point, we might consider our design again. We might consider, you know, should we define the problem differently? Should we maybe use a different scoring rule, um, one that better separates these things? Um, uh, and so, you know, these are the kind of uh, design questions that we could ask ourselves. Um, in this case, you know, we ran the experiment, um, and so post-experimentally, we might want to also um, do some analysis. And so um, now we're going to try to rank the different behavioral responses that we got and compare them to these these different sort of baselines. Um, but first, I'm going to normalize the scale. So the rational agent with the prior is now at zero, and the rational agent with the visualization um, is at one. Um, and so now we want to take the behavioral responses and, and somehow compare them. Um, one of the challenges in doing that with behavioral data um, is that you know, we have to account for the experiment design. Um, so you know, in this case, we had this kind of complex experiment design in the, the KLA all paper. So we had people doing repeated measures. So the same person gave us multiple judgments across different ground truth effect sizes. We also had a within subjects manipulation where some charts showed the mean and some charts did not annotate the mean. And so basically in order to kind of compare our behavioral responses, we have to account for all for these design things because the rational agent you know, it doesn't matter what order they see things in, it, they're always going to give the same response. But for a behavioral agent, things like the order in which you do trials or see um, visualizations can matter. Uh, and so um, luckily, in this case, we had uh, fit uh, Bayesian regressions. And so these are inherently generative models. And so we can basically generate responses from our posterior predictive distribution. And we can uh, kind of uh, marginalize over the nuisance parameters, things like the order effects, um, the random effects of individual subjects. And so we can rank the behavioral uh, visualizations or the behavioral agents with visualizations. And when we do this, we would hope maybe that we see them between the, the rational agent with the prior and um, you know, the rational agent with the full visualization. Um, so is that what we see? Uh, not in this case. Um, so I'm going to give myself more space on the slide um, because when we do this with the different visualizations in our experiment, one thing that we observe is that most of these um, are doing worse than the rational agent with the prior. Um, and so, you know, we see kind of the same ordering um, that we saw in the original results. The dot plots with means do better for probability superiority judgments and um, the hypothetical outcome plots do kind of the worst. Um, but this is sort of interesting, this idea that, um, you know, we're doing worse than the rational agent with the prior. Um, so 
I think one thing we can conclude is that, you know, we didn't give people the prior and that's probably kind of a mistake because now when we try to do this kind of ranking, we don't know, like, are people far from the optimal response um, because they don't have the prior for the problem or are they far from the optimal response because they're behavioral and they're doing something weird? Um, and so one thing we might do is, you know, go back and run this experiment where we give people the prior and then we see, you know, do they do any better with the visualizations? But um, you know, this is kind of this, this interesting, um, uh, you know, uh, property we have of a lot of the, these visualization experiments where the, the prior is not always well defined or it's not given to people. In this case, I honestly think if we re-ran the experiment and we gave people the prior, probably things would not change that much. Um, just because in this case, remember the response scale is 50 to 100. Um, the ground truth effect sizes are 55 to 95. And the expectation or the prior is going to be around 75. And I think when people do an experiment like this, they're shown data, they're, they're basically probably going to assume a uniform prior over the response range. Um, but it's still technically it's a it's sort of a flaw in this work. Um, so, uh, you know, doing this kind of analysis, we realize this. Um, so when a behavioral agent with some visualization does worse than the rational agent, another thing we might wonder about is, you know, uh, you know, even assume we gave them the prior and they still did worse. Is it that they didn't get any information from the visualization or is it that they didn't use the optimal strategy um, to report the information they got? Um, and so, you know, one way we can try to distinguish this is we can take our behavioral responses um, and, you know, we know the ground truth for these behavioral responses, like we ran the experiment. And so we can use kind of the correlation between the ground truth and the response we got for these different conditions to uh, define a calibrated behavioral response for each type of visualization. Um, so here, this is basically, um, you know, how it sort of reflects how much information is contained in the behavioral responses. So if you knew the ground truth and you didn't get the visualization, but you got the response the people gave you, um, you know, how, how much better do you do? So the calibrated responses have to be better than the rational agent with prior. Um, but, you know, seeing where they fall, you know, it looks like there's still a long way to go in terms of people, you know, getting the information from the visualizations. Um, and so, uh, you know, this can, it gets us thinking as sort of about, you know, um, why is it that people are still pretty far? Um, how do we improve their ability to get the information from the visualization, for instance? Um, similarly, we can add things like a heuristic to try to, again, make sense of the behavioral results we got. Um, so here I talked about this mean distance heuristic. I never quite defined it formally, but imagine here people are using a heuristic where they look at the distance or the difference in means between the scores um, that they see in the visualization. And then they divide by something like the total score range. So the total range in the visualization that's shown. So they're sort of mapping this or this becomes an effect size judgment or a probability judgment. If people are using this kind of heuristic like strictly, um, we see that they do way worse than the rational agent with the prior and way worse than the behavioral responses. And so, um, you know, this is also sort of interesting to think about because it implies that like, even though, you know, people reported using these mean distance heuristics, whatever they were doing, you know, it's not that they were ignoring the variance information completely. Like they were getting some information. Um, it wasn't as bad as like totally ignoring everything but the means. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so this kind of, you know, framework I think can help us reason about um, things pre-experimentally and post-experimentally. And I'll just say sort of anecdotally as someone who's done different experiments, um, you know, I'm particularly excited about the idea that we can calibrate the behavioral responses to reflect on how much information people got about a test. So I have other papers that have also won awards, um, one of which, you know, we had people do a causal inference task. So we showed them data. So we basically showed them like contingency table data. And we asked them to tell us which of two possible models that produced that data, um, what was the probability that they would assign to each. And so the two models were different DAGs representing different possible causal models, where in one model there was a treatment effect, uh, uh, there was a causal effect of a treatment, and in another there wasn't. And we had people do this task and their responses looked terrible. Um, and so um, what was interesting when we looked at how they described what they were doing, it looked like, or it sounded like they were often looking for the right things in the visualizations. It's just when they responded on the probabilities, like it was way off. And so 
um, in that paper, we concluded like people are just bad at this causal inference task and no visualization seems to help them. Um, but I think probably if we went back and did this kind of calibrated analysis, we might find that like they're, they were getting some information if they were using reasonable strategies. Um, it's just that somehow there's like a breakdown when they have to go report in a probability scale. So, so anyway, as someone who does experiments, I think this kind of analysis um, allows us to think a lot more deeply about what these effects that we estimate actually mean. Um, and um, just before I wrap up, I want to briefly highlight, you know, there's other applications, I think, um, where we can bring in sort of um, other types of theoretical models to directly ask design questions for things like representations of uncertainty. Um, so for one other application we're working on right now, we're starting to think about this core visualization question of like, how do I decide when and how to aggregate the data? Um, so different visual analytics systems currently use different defaults, like some will, will aggregate your data by default, others will show the raw data um, by default. And so you can imagine a designer might want to think about, you know, different data conditions, um, different possible visualizations that differ in kind of the amount of information they provide um, and ask questions about, you know, for different scoring rules, for different um, data generating processes, like what is the cost of the worst aggregation? Um, and so in this case, um, because the visualizations differ um, in information, like they would differ to a rational agent, we're essentially relying on Blackwell ordering to, we basically have visualizations, um, some of which are like a garbling of the others. Um, and we can do this kind of like, again, like without running any experiments, we can try to answer these visualization design questions. Um, one thing I'm kind of excited about with this, um, or that I'd like to work on with this kind of work is rather than thinking about these individual judgments, which I think is a little unrealistic if we're thinking about people doing visual analysis, um, I think it would be interesting to think about, you know, how do things like aggregation choices affect sequential um, analysis processes? So things like Palm DPs might be interesting here, I think, to sort of model, you know, how does the effect of seeing data aggregated versus not affect like what you go on to do in a visual analysis process. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunities to formalize things that people doing interfaces research are sort of grappling with, but, but in a not well-defined way. Um, so to summarize, yeah, I think this, this intersection between uh, visualization and HCI or in theory is um, quite productive. Um, I have other projects I didn't talk about that also deal with theory in, in other ways or where theory might be brought to bear. Um, but I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, I think what is interesting about a lot of these problems that I see um, in my field of visualization is that there's these kind of big open questions um, related to this ambiguity um, when it comes to sort of what types of inference problems we should be um, trying to address with interfaces, better interfaces, and which types are not worth kind of the effort of worrying about the display. And so I like to think about this anthropic principle in stats, which is sort of loosely defined or colloquial, colloquially um, discussed. But the idea is that if you're going to do statistical modeling, there are certain problems where you want to do it and certain problems where you, you shouldn't even bother. Um, so if your signal to noise ratio is huge, um, you don't really need to do statistical modeling. Um, if your, your data is so confounded relative to the amount of sort of signal or pattern in it, um, you know, that you're hopeless with modeling, like don't waste your time. So it's really this, this middle ground where, you know, statistical modeling can help us. And I think when it comes to visualization, um, you know, and what, what's a sufficient problem for visualization, I think we would probably all agree in the field that, you know, when the signal to noise ratio is huge, then visualization suffices. Like we don't need any other type of analysis. Um, but I think there's these really interesting questions that we, we haven't defined well at all in the field about, you know, when do we think someone, uh, can just use visual analysis when we're in this middle range? Um, when do we think like visual analysis will help, but this has to be followed up with like collecting new data, et cetera? Um, you know, are there some problems in this space where visual analysis is enough? Um, and I think there's lots of sort of real world problems that come up that have sort of made me want to answer these questions. So things like, you know, for years we've been designing visual analysis systems that sort of suppress uncertainty. Um, we don't really worry about it so much. And, you know, in some ways these things must be working. And so what is it that we're lacking in terms of how we think about these problems that doesn't allow us to explain things like sometimes, you know, showing people uncertainty doesn't really, doesn't really change things or doesn't really improve what they're doing. So anyway, I think there's lots of room to formalize these things. So I'll conclude there. Um, I have to thank all of my uh, current and former PhD students. Um, my student Priyanka is here for the quarter. I didn't get to talk about her work, but we do differential privacy work, um, interfaces work together. Um, so yeah, thanks for your time and I'm happy to take any questions.
Um, is there um, any uh, sort of clear cut bad design practices for visual visualizing uncertainty? Um, yeah, I mean, I think error bars. So I didn't talk about any of the results, but there's over the last 10 years, there's been many studies showing that like even, you know, people who use error bars in their research um, often fail to connect them to things like statistical significance. So, um, you know, people think they can use these rules of thumb about like whether they overlap or not. Um, a lot of times people are wrong about, you know, what that means. Um, there's other biases like in lay people. So if you show people an error bar, on a bar chart, like they tend to think that the bottom range of the error bar that's on top of the bar represents like a more probable set of values than the top of the error bar because it sort of kind of looks uneven like that. So in general, error bars are, I think, often the worst you can do. And it's also just hard to explain like to a lay person what, an, what a confidence interval, which is, you know, sometimes what we're showing means, you know, we're, we're making a statement about our confidence in the method that produced the interval, not in the specific interval. And so, um, so yeah, that 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 I feel comfortable saying is is not a good choice ever. It's for these other things where you know I start to question like how much does it really matter? Because um, often people are using these heuristics um, that make things look similar, even if you have you know what should theoretically be a better visualization. Um, but in general, I didn't talk about it too much. Like the hypothetical outcome plots I showed. We talk about these as like frequency-based uncertainty representation. Um, and so there's a lot of work in like cognitive psych, for instance, um, going back to like the 80s, where people have found that if you want to help people, you know, do better on like classic Bayesian reasoning tasks, you should frame probability as frequency. So don't say like 80% of the time, say like eight out of 10 times. And so some of the work in my lab um, has tried to look at like how do we make uncertainty representations that use like a frequency or discrete framing to help people think about probability. Um, and so actually the study I showed, we had the hypothetical outcome plots, which are one way of doing things with frequency. We also have uh, used a lot of these quantile dot plots and these ended up doing best in this particular study, but it's basically just like a discretized version of the density. Um, and weirdly, we find that like when you ask people probability estimate questions or incentivize decisions, they tend to do better just from this simple trick of like making the representation discrete. Um, yeah, that's a short sort of... Uh, about what we've learned. Thanks for the talk. I just sure. wanted to add um, an example that I wish you could have tackled. Of the cover of this month's Wired magazine. The cover, the cover story is about a pharmaceutical startup in San Francisco that claims to be able to uh, give your dog your pet dog, a drug that will extend its life. Oh, nice. And in the article, there's no, there's, they never mention anything about distributions or confidence intervals. All they say mm -hmm. is breed X lives to 10 years and this drug will make them live to 14 years. Yeah, no, and that's incredibly common. Like I have a paper actually called why authors don't uh, visualize uncertainty, um, which is based on this, like the economist Chuck Mansky has the term incredible certitude that he uses. To refer to how it's like sort of normal in the media and in government reporting even to just like present the estimates without uncertainty so it's like we're like incredibly precise um uh and yeah i think like that problem is really interesting like why we are okay with that and i think some of these questions i want to ask about like when does it actually matter to have the uncertainty kind of get at that i think we don't you know there's these whole arguments about like standardized versus unstandardized effect size um and I feel like there's still a lot we haven't understood about like when we should care and when we shouldn't. Um, so yeah, no, I see those examples all the time. Um, and they bug me, but they bug me less than they used to because, because I also see that like sometimes it doesn't actually matter if you show the uncertainty. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, if I understand correctly, you assume independency between the two population when you wanted to uh, estimate POS in your experiments. Yeah, those were all independent just because, I mean, it's not really fair to show people static plots if they're correlated. Yeah, so my question is that how hard or easy should be when we want to incorporate dependency in visualization? 
I mean, I think, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we use animation so we can show like true, you know, multivariate samples um, in general, like, I mean, if you know what kind of, you know, if it's like low dimensional data and people care about correlation, they'll use like heat maps or things like that. So you would generally just switch the visualization type, um, you know, if you cared about like joint probabilities. The problem is that when you have these more complicated displays where you have many different variables and people might care about many different joint probabilities then it's just hard to visualize. Like we just don't have good techniques. Um, and so that's where like the hypothetical outcome plots are really meant for these more complex cases um, uh, where there's just no way to get joint probability information from a static display. You have to like know every possible query in advance. Um, that helps at all. Yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question. So um, you, use animation clearly, is there a role for interactive displays? Is that useful? Yeah, um, sometimes it works or sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, in general, I think I'm a fan of like simulation. I think a lot of people benefit when they can drive something themselves even, you know, so I wanna, um, like this stuff we're doing with model checking. So we're basically trying to build visual analysis tools that let you sort of check implicit assumptions you might have about like the causal relationships between different variables. And there, I think, you know, it's very powerful to be able to sort of say like, I wanna see predictions from a model like this. And so people interact a lot with this, um, this like model backend that we have. Um, another, but another, in other places we've seen, like we think interaction should help and it, it actually doesn't. So we, you know, I mentioned this other paper we did um, where we had people do these sort of causal inference tasks where you're trying to, to determine is, was there a treatment effect? And we had causal inference tasks of varying difficulties and we showed people, you know, uh, visualizations of sample data. And there we did have some displays were interactive because we thought like, if you can cross filter things, you can see like how many people have the gene and how many people, you know, have the, uh, got the treatment and um, you would think they would help and they didn't help at all, basically. So it's, I think it really, a lot of it depends on what do people know what they're doing, I think. Um, and one of the hardest things I think is like for me to realize that like I designed this visualization that I thought was like the optimal way to like not let people use heuristics. And like they still, if they don't know what they're doing, they're gonna use it in the exactly wrong way. And so I think this, that's one of the hardest parts is like, how do you get people to understand how to use some representation correctly. Um, well, I imagine interaction can actually hurt sometimes. So. Sometimes, yeah, because yeah. people start clicking around. And actually some people have started calling like visual analysis tools like Tableau, which really is about like, just show me the patterns, um, you know, p-hacking machines, because you have all this flexibility to, to look at your data in all sorts of different ways. And I mean, if you think of someone doing like null hypothesis significance <laughs> testing visually, then, you know, of course they're gonna find something with a large data set. Um, I'm not sure that that's really as big a problem as we think about. I think the fact that like in visualization research and interfaces research, we often don't think about like, what is the payoff of making a better decision? Like, I think a lot of times when people do like the like business analysts are doing visual analysis, like they're only using it maybe for lower stakes problems. Like it, there's all these questions that without formalizing things, I think it's just like people rely on their hunches, which bugs me. <laughs> so. Uh, hi, Jessica. A fascinating talk uh, introducing this area. So like anecdotally, one area where I always complain about visualization is like weather forecasts. And yeah. like, for example, you know, I'll see it's like 50% to rain at five o'clock, 50% to rain at six o'clock. But I have no idea if these are like negatively correlated with where there's like a cloud it's either right. going to drop by yeah. five o'clock or six o'clock or it's like positively correlated where there's a cloud it's either going to come or it's not going to come yeah and you know, also have no sense of it. if i check again three hours later will i get a more updated forecast you know yeah i'm wondering if you've ever thought about like yeah i mean i think weather forecasting is hard like the people i know who have like looked at that domain i think in a lot of these domains actually where we're dealing with lay people there's something called deterministic construal error that people talk about which is basically like no matter what you show people no matter how you show them some sort of uncertainty, they're gonna think that it's deterministic. And so with like, I know with weather forecasts, if you try to show them things like, you know, the uncertainty and the predict, predicted high temperature, people, you know, no matter how clearly you try to label it, there's a strong tendency to see it as like the low and the high for the day. And like the, the hurricane forecast, they use this cone of uncertainty and it shows, you know, an interval around like the projected hurricane path, but people interpret it as the size of the storm. And so, I mean, weather forecasts, yeah, like, uh, you know, people don't understand what the 50% means. Like they think um, my student was actually saying she read something about like, you know, 
people think like it's raining 50% of the area. Um, and I, yeah, like the correlations, I think I run, wonder about that stuff too. And I mean, there was like a company dark sky that I think was doing a better job with some of the uncertainty representations. I think they got acquired, but, um, yeah, it's a space where I think people have given up trying, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, so yeah, maybe meteorologists have their own displays that they just won't let us use. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.